Let's just commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Let's, um, let's join our hearts together in prayer, praying now. Lord, we do thank you for the world in which we live, the area of the world in which we live, even with wet and windy weather. Lord, you thank you that you've given us uh, so many things. And Lord, the greatest thing that you have given us is, um, is your only son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just pray that whether we are in the congregation in Welshpool or we are here in Newtown, Lord, we thank you that we have such great unity in the gospel, that during this time now, um, that we can unite our hearts and join together in praise and worship of our dear Saviour. Um, Lord, we pray that you'll be with Rogers. He speaks to us in a few minutes' time. Speak through him and bring glory to your name. Uh, Lord, we just commit this time to you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. If you are here this morning, um, I'll say a verse now which you might, um, you might remember from this morning. We mentioned one of these verses this morning, but it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to 34, it says, What shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against whom, those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And we looked at this, that theme of interceding this, this morning with a great theme of today being resurrect, um, sorry, Ascension Sunday. And we have such a great Saviour that who is interceding for us now. And it says there's so much hope in those words there, isn't there? We, we can be assured that actually if we trust Christ that he will take us to be with him forever. Um, so we're going to start on that note of praise. And um, that's such assurance now. So with our first hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. I'm going to start with a few uh, notices just for uh, this week, um, and it's great tonight, as mentioned, to be joined by the folk um, in Walshpool. It's great to have you with us, and as mentioned, Roger will be opening up God's Word to share, um, speaking on a number of passages in Acts, but focusing on um, the church in Antioch. Um, I was going to say this, singing outside afterwards. Um, 
They might be singing outside afterwards, um, so feel free. We can sing in the rain, that would be fine. Um, so up to 30 people are allowed to sing outside afterwards, but we'll check on the weather, obviously. I think I'm right in saying that I think from next week, about 50 people can sing outside, so um, look forward to that. Um, we have our midweek meeting here in those uh, in Newtown. Um, on Wednesday, we, it's, we are asking just members to come to the prayer meeting on Wednesday night. Uh, we specifically want to share some with the members. Um, it's not a business meeting. There's not going to be any voting or anything. It's just something that the elders and deacons uh, would wish to share with the members to ask for their, their prayer. Um, so that's on Wednesday night. Just a couple of bits of personal news from people in the, in the fellowship. We mentioned this morning Norman Gunn. Um, is moving down to South Sea um, on Friday uh, to live near his daughter and grandchildren. Um, uh, so pray for him in, in that move, but also um, that he settles well. And actually, he's very much viewing this as evangelism as well for, for his own family. So lift up Norman over the next few weeks. And we mentioned this morning, Bob and Liz Granger, um, this was their last Sunday with us this morning before they go up to uh, Cyprus uh, this week. So again, just pray for them um, over the next few few weeks. I'm going to ask John if he can come and open up God's Word for us. So the first passage, we're going to look at a couple of passages in Acts. So if you can open up to Acts chapter 8 to begin with. Acts chapter 8. Thanks, John. Hi, good evening, everybody. It's true, all well. So it's Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, and followed by Acts 11, 19 to 30. So Acts 8, being the verse 1. And Saul approved of their killing, actually the killing of Stephen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Now into Acts 11, 19 to 30. And this is on page 1105 in the Church Bibles. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw that the grace of God, sorry, what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, one of them named Agabus. He stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Amen. Thank you, John. 
And before we go on to look at those um, passages, and there's one more um, passage in Acts we'll read as well. Before that happens, um, let's just commit this time again to the Lord and let's pray for the work there in Welshpool as well. So let's, let's pray. Again, Lord, we do thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that as we can see in those passages, that as the, um, your disciples are scattered, uh, actually churches were planted, um, your word was not bound. Uh, Lord, we thank you that people were saved. And Lord, we pray that as we look at this church in Antioch tonight, Lord, we pray that we would be challenged. We pray that we would be encouraged. Um, Lord, we thank you that you, the church is your, your hope for the world to reach out to the nations. And Lord, we just pray that we would see the, the value and the, um, the importance of the local church. And to that end, Lord, we do pray for the work in Welshpool. Lord, we pray that you would build that church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Lord, we pray that you'll be adding to their number those who are being saved, but also adding knowledge and depth of insight in, in your words. Lord, build them up um, uh, year after year. We pray for um, Tom and for Roger as they would seek to lead um, in your ways, that church. Lord, we pray that you'll give them great wisdom to minister in these difficult days. Uh, Lord, we do pray uh, for the church as well, not being able to meet physically at the moment because um, not having their own building. Lord, we pray that in the near future you would be able to provide um, just the right building for them to be able to meet together, to have fellowship together and to worship together, for them to be able to do evangelism together. Lord, we pray that the church wouldn't just be inward-looking, but outward-looking, that they would have a real heart and burden to reach out to the lost in the community there in Welshpool. Lord, we do pray for Roger again tonight. We pray that, again, as we look at this church in Antioch, we pray that you would speak through um, Roger this evening. Lord, as we often pray up here, Lord, we pray that who, whoever's involved in the service tonight, in that sense, would be forgotten, but, Lord, we pray that Christ would be glorified this evening. Lord, we hope pray these things now in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Well, we need God to speak to us this evening through his word. So before uh, Roger comes up to speak, we're going to have one more hymn where we have a chance to reflect on Speak, O Lord, as we come to you.
thank you for the warm welcome that you've given to us this evening and you always give to us um, when we join with you and we're so pleased to be able to do so. Um, I'm going to continue just with a brief reading uh, from Acts, the end of chapter 12, verse 25 into chapter 13. Chapter 12, verse 25. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And we thank God for his word. Antioch was some 300 miles north of Jerusalem, not to be confused with Pisidian Antioch. Uh, one of the towns that Paul visited on a missionary journey. It was founded in 301 BC and it became the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It was called the Queen of the East. It was a splendid city culturally and economically. It had a population which was cosmopolitan many different people from many different uh, backgrounds uh, could be found living there. And it was the capital of the Roman province of Syria at the time. But this is a bit more like what it was to live there. One writer says, the main street was more than four miles long, paved with marble and lined on both sides by marble colonnades. It was the only city in the ancient world at that time that had its streets lit at night. A busy port and a center for luxury and culture. Antioch attracted all kinds of people, including wealthy retired Roman officials who spent their days chatting in the baths or gambling at the races. With its large cosmopolitan population and its great commercial and political power, Antioch presented to the church an exciting opportunity for evangelism. Antioch was a wicked city, perhaps second only to Corinth. Although all the Greek, Roman and Syrian deities were honored, the local shrine was dedicated to Daphne, whose worship included immoral practices. That's a flavor of life in Antioch in the first century. Of course, we're in the first century, of course, AD, and we're in the period following the ministry of Jesus on earth. Jesus, who had come here, had died, risen, and ascended. And ten days later, the risen Lord Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit to the gathered believers, 120 of them gathered in Jerusalem, and the apostles began preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in Jerusalem, and then into Judea, the surrounding area, with remarkable results. Thousands of people were converted to Christ. And they began to turn the Jewish world upside down at that time. But persecution began, persecution of these Christian believers. It began slowly, first Peter and John. But then it began to increase. And suddenly, as it seemed, Stephen was martyred 
And then there broke out against the Christians a most severe persecution. This man, Saul of Tarsus, was bent on arresting every Christian he could find. He would travel as far as he needed to to arrest Christians, to imprison them, and if possible, to have them executed. And in these circumstances, many of the believers who had lived in Jerusalem were now scattered to different parts of the country and probably further afield. And some of them found their way to Antioch. And that's why I read, or had read, those three passages. Uh, Acts 8, 11 and 13 just gives us, really, uh, an outline of uh, what we see here at Antioch, what happens here at Antioch. Just briefly, a, a church was established amongst Gentile people by unnamed evangelists. I say unnamed evangelists, but as these people were told specifically preached the gospel to the Greeks, the Gentile Greeks, if you look at the names in chapter 13, you'll see that some of those names would fit a Gentile Greek background. Some of the names of the people who were leaders in the church in Antioch. And it seems to me that it's most likely that perhaps a couple of those were amongst uh, the believers who fled from Jerusalem to go to Antioch. So a, a church was established. You might say established informally. People would move to new premises to live and speak to their neighbours. But also formally. There seems to have been opportunities to gather people together to preach to them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jerusalem church leaders got to hear about this and sent Barnabas to check out what was going on in Antioch. And he endorses and he, he is encouraged as he sees what has happened. And then later he sends for help from this man Saul this incredible uh, persecutor of the church between the beginning of this persecution and what we have now at Antioch he has been suddenly and dramatically converted to Jesus Christ and now Barnabas is calling on him to help to consolidate the work and and this mission is clearly authenticated as being a genuine gospel work by true conversions, by growth in the faith, and by the good work shown by the people. And all this was as a direct result of the powerful working of God's Holy Spirit. This passage was prompted to my thinking for, for tonight, before I knew I'd be preaching. <laughs> um, on, your, on two of your sermons on Romans 16 um, and your emphasis on evangelism and, uh, and what we have here is a snapshot in these three passages of what a first century church looked like uh, and therefore what a 21st century church should look like and it's interesting that the passage begins and the, the three passages taken together begin and end in the same way. It begins with believers preaching the gospel and planting a church. And the, the, the three passages that we cover here, it ends with the believers planning to go out to preach the gospel and plant other churches. So we've got bookends which are significant.
Now, I think the phrase I really want to draw attention to in chapter 11 is what happens when Barnabas arrives. Can you see verse 23 if you have your Bibles open? When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done. All that had happened in Antioch was because of this statement. What happened in Antioch was because of the unmerited love and mercy of God towards these people. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done. In a sense, that's what he was looking for. That's what he was hoping for. That's what he was expecting to find. And he was glad when he saw it and encouraged them. And this is what we should look for. In a 21st century church, this is what we should aim for when we plant new churches. The, e the evidence of the grace of God. But bear this in mind as we go through this tonight. We're talking at the moment about the church as, as a group, as a company of people. But all that we say tonight is true of each individual believer who forms part of that church. It's a very obvious thing to say, really, but almost we can forget it by just saying the church at Antioch was like this. But it's only, the church was only like this because of the grace of God's work in the individual lives of all the people who formed that church. So, what I want to ask tonight are, what are the evidences of the grace of God in the life of a church? What are the evidences? I want to suggest, first of all, that the first evidence, and probably the most important evidence, is that this church was a living church. It was a living church. You might say, a bit of an odd thing to say, the people, when they gathered, were very much alive. <laughs> very obvious, really. But it wasn't. That was not the, the, the living that I was thinking about. Here were people uh, who were spiritually alive prior to these preachers and these people coming to live in, in Antioch. They had no knowledge of the one true living God. They didn't know that, that, that this God had revealed himself in Jesus. But these people had come, these Christian believers, these disciples, sorry, had come to the city and they'd begun to preach about Jesus and something had happened to these people, these, these people who formed the church in Antioch. A miracle happened. A miracle of God's grace and God's power. These people heard the message of Jesus Christ and they believed it and they turned to the Lord. They heard that God had revealed himself in history in Jesus and they learned from these preachers that we're all separated from God by our sin. We have this bias within us that, that drives us to go our own way in life, doesn't want to submit to God. We're separated with God by our transgressions, by our breaking of his laws. We're separated because the best we can do as individuals fails to reach the standard required to have a fellowship with the living God. And they began to hear that this holy God must punish sin. They began to hear that this Jesus who had come was coming again and he would come to judge 
and it was imperative that men and women should be in a right relationship with him. But then they began to hear that the offended God has done something amazing. The offended God sent his only begotten son into the world. And Jesus was born here and he lived here and he lived a perfect life. But he came to the end of his life and he was taken and he was cruelly uh, crucified on the cross. But you see, because of God's great love for us, this was God's plan and purpose. And God was making a way for us to come into his presence, to come into a relationship with him, because Jesus died bearing our sin, bearing our punishment, bearing that judgment. And those who believed this message and turned to the Lord, their sins would be forgiven. They would have new life, spiritual life. They would be born again. And as this message was preached, that's exactly what happened. Men and women heard this message and they were convinced of the truth of this message and they were convicted that they were sinners and they believed it and they turned to the Lord. Turned to the Lord. They turned away from their old life and they turned to trusting in Jesus Christ and following Jesus Christ and worshipping the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, they received new life. They were indeed a living church. They were people alive to God. And my first question tonight is this. Are you alive spiritually? And you look back to a time, maybe not suddenly, perhaps over a period of time, when the things of God began to dawn upon you. Maybe suddenly. Suddenly God spoke to you. But has there been a change in your life? Has your life been turned around? Have you experienced being born again? A living church comprises of people who are in a living relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can come into a relationship with God. Through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. They're alive, spiritually. They pass from the realm of death to the realm of life. That's the first evidence of the grace of God in this church, the Antioch. And that's the first evidence of a true church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the people who belong to it, who are committed to Christ and committed to the church, they've experienced God's grace in their own life. And so, quite obviously, when these people were converted, they found themselves, in a sense, so different that they were attracted to people who had had the similar experience. And they were encouraged to meet together. And so the second evidence of the grace of God in people's lives is that, first of all, a person is converted to Christ by the grace of God, and then they come together with others. It had happened in Jerusalem. And now it was happening in Antioch. Well, why? Well, because, as our saying goes, birds of a feather flock together. And that's what Christians have always done, and they always do. And they suddenly became aware that they were part of what we call a local church, a local company of people who lived in Antioch. Um, and 
maybe they didn't stay as one. <laughs> there seems to be a lot of people come to faith and they had a number of leaders, so it could be that there was more than one group eventually meeting. But they came to realize that they came into a fellowship with other people, other Christians, who had exactly the same experience as they had. But Barnabas arrived, and these people who had come to faith in Jesus Christ and formed this local church began to be aware, perhaps uh, more practically, more really, that in fact they were part of a bigger thing that was going on. That back in Jerusalem there were believers. Barnabas had come from them. He'd been sent by them. Uh, and, and in other places there were groups of believers. And you see, the evidence of the grace of God is this, that Christians not only come into fellowship with one another in a local area, but they come into fellowship with other true believers in larger fellowships, away, in the next town, further afield. Not only were they local churches, but they found themselves linked to one another in a sense of fellowship believing the same things, experiencing the same joys and battles and difficulties and sorrows and, and, and victories. They were in a local church, but they were also part of a, of a much bigger church of Jesus Christ that was spreading throughout the then known world. And soon there would be churches spreading out into the Roman Empire linked together by this same gospel, this same life. And here tonight we have two independent evangelical churches meeting together. But we're also linked. We're linked. The church here has helped the church at Welshpool, helped to found the work. It's given advice and pastoral care and support. It's helped in practical ways. But we're also linked, aren't we, to other believers in Wales. Other believers through the FIC in the United Kingdom. In answer to Jesus' prayer that his people may be one. So Barnabas was glad when he saw the evidence of the grace of God in these people being converted and being part of this local church and they were suddenly realizing that they were part of a bigger thing the church of the Lord Jesus Christ my dear friends are you committed to this church if you're a person who lives in Newtown if you're a Christian has God brought you here so that you can settle here and be committed here be encouraged Do you pray for other churches in Mid Wales? Do you pray for other churches in North Wales, South Wales? Over 600 churches in the fellowship of the FIC. An evidence of the grace of God is that we see ourselves as part of a local church where we can grow in our faith and where we see ourselves as part of God's great work that's going on, in fact, now, all over the world. But the third evidence of the grace of God that we see in this church is this, that it was a church that was a learning church. It was a learning church. Now, it sounds a bit dull, doesn't it? it sounds a bit like going back to school. When I first left school teaching, um, I, I used to wake up some Monday mornings and think, oh, I've got to go to school. <laughs> but I didn't have to, because I was doing something else at the time. And, uh, uh, but, so learning might sound a bit, a bit dull, really. But, you know, I'm, I'm just 73. I've been a Christian over 50 years, and I love to be part of a learning church. Um, I love to be part of a learning church when I was first converted, and then when we were first married, um, and, and then when I went into the ministry, and then since coming out of the ministry full-time, um, coming to 
be part of Welshpool Community Church and coming here on many Sunday evenings over the last nearly five years. I love to be part of a learning church, a church that opens the Bible, God's Word, and teaches me something. I love to be. I can never get beyond people who are content with the minimum of church life. I just cannot work it out. I can't. And this church was a learning church. They were already being taught by their own leaders. And then when Barnabas appears, they're very willing to be taught by him. Of course, he had a loving spirit, didn't he? He was the best sort of person to send to have a look at this church. Very encouraging man. In fact, that's what his name means, son of encouragement. It was a nickname given to him by the church in Jerusalem. And so he teaches the church. And they're very glad to be taught by Barnabas, as well as their own leaders. Sitting under the ministry of God's word, week by week. And then they're very glad when Saul comes. There doesn't seem to be any jealousy. They seem to accept their own leaders, the ministry of Barnabas, the ministry of Saul. And they wanted to learn the faith. Do you have a desire for Bible teaching? If you haven't, you may not be a Christian. Or you may be a Christian who has lost their appetite. But it can be restored. And you see, we need the ministry of God's word. Story is told at the end of a, a, a sermon that I have a copy of here on the importance of the Bible. And the preacher says, I am reminded of a story told by an old Welsh preacher. That's, a, that's an apt one for tonight, isn't it? Many years ago, a church lad had to make a journey from a lonely Welsh farmhouse to his home. It was nighttime and very dark. The trees on the hills were creaking in the wind. A storm was blowing up, looked like, outside. Uh, and in the distance, the sound of thunder could be heard. As the door of the farmhouse opened, the forms of the old farmer and the young boy became visible in the light of the house. The boy is fearful as he looks along the lonely path he is to take. But how can I go tonight, he's saying. It's so dark. I'm afraid of the storm losing my way. The old farmer lays a hand upon the lad's shoulder. Davy boy, he says. Take this lamp. It has often been used, but it is no worse for that. It's been travel, uh, it has seen travellers safely along this road for more years than I care to remember. Hold it tight, you'll need it. No wind, no tempest can extinguish it. It will not fail you. You can trust it, Davy boy. It will guide you safely home. Trembling, the young lad grasped the lamp as though his very life did depended upon it, and made his way fearfully, though steadily, along the path, through the woods and over the hills, until eventually he arrived safely home. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Evidence of the grace of God is that these new believers are a learning community. But a fourth evidence of the grace of God is this. Is this, that a true church of the Lord Jesus Christ is a loving community. I've already hinted at it, really, haven't I, in, in what I was saying about the way in which the, 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 the new, these believers accepted the ministry of new people. That seems to me to suggest very strongly that there was a loving relationship between the church and its own leadership and with the coming of Barnabas and with the coming of Saul there was a bond between them of love and affection no resentment and God's blessing was on them there was a loving unity that's where God's blessing falls Psalm 133 tells us that 
But of course, there is another uh, evidence of the love that was in the hearts and lives of these people. And they heard about the needs of believers, of disciples in Jerusalem and Judea who were facing a period of famine. And they are moved to do something about it. And they gladly and willingly bring their gifts according to how they can give, according to their means. Why, what, what has happened to these people? Why are they so willing to, to be in this loving relationship with their leaders and, and, and express a, a practical loving relationship with other believers who they've never met? Well, a very simple thing is when a person is converted to Christ, God's love is poured into their hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Jesus said, this is how people would learn about him when his people loved one another. He said, I give you a new commandment, he said to his disciples. Love one another as I have loved you. What a way Jesus has loved us. <laughs> there is no love like the love of Jesus. And where there's a group of people meeting together, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, love is an evidence. The evidence of the grace of God is seen also in the leadership of these churches. We've mentioned the leaders. These men that are mentioned in chapter 13, these leaders of this local church, that's where the evidence of the grace of God can also be seen. What was very special about these men was this. They were gospel-focused people. They were gospel-focused people. How do I know that? Well, I think that some of them would have been involved in the founding of the church, which means they were part of the group that had come from Jerusalem to found the work in uh, Antioch. And they were gospel-focused when they did it. And I know that they were gospel-focused, but we're told in verse 21, is it, that the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. They were preaching the gospel. And when Barnabas came and he started teaching the church, he carried on preaching the gospel. How do I know? Well, because it tells us uh, that when he came, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. They were gospel-focused people. In fact, the description of, of Barnabas there gives you a, an idea of the grace of God in a leader. This is what you... This is what God's grace does in the life of a leader of a church. It, it makes him like we're, we're given a little outline here. He was a good man, a good man. Man of integrity. Man can be relied upon by the grace of God. He was a good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He was mature in the faith. He was full of faith. He was a good man by the grace of God. He was full of the Holy Spirit, mature in his faith. He was full of faith, full of faith. That could mean faithfulness. He was full of faith. I think it's more. I, I think it's a little bit like what's said of Caleb in the Old Testament. He followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Oh, he was full of faith. He was wholehearted. He, he was a, these leaders were a bit like Carey. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. That's what men of faith do. And, and here they are in chapter 13, exercising that faith in the purposes of God. They knew that Jesus had said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. They were exercising their faith in the purposes of God, the promise of Jesus to build his church, and the power of God that would enable them to see people converted. They exercised that faith, and they were planning on planting other churches, sending out gospel preachers. 
They were like men of Issachar in the Old Testament who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Here were men who understood the times and knew what the church should be about. That's an evidence of the grace of God. Another evidence of the grace of God is that this church was committed to prayer. We only have a few verses about this church that we've read tonight. <laughs> and one of them is about the church at prayer, not just the leaders, but the leaders and the people at prayer. And ever since believers started meeting together, they met for prayer. They met for prayer. Jesus had prayed regularly. Jesus had taught his disciples to pray. Jesus had prayed at special times. Prayer meetings are very revealing. Prayer meetings are very revealing. They tell you where people are at. They tell you where people's hearts are. They tell you what people's mind is on. And great movements of God, Old Testament, New Testament, and history are always associated with prayer. A people dependent upon God. That's what prayer is, isn't it? We bring our praise, our adoration, our worship, but we are dependent upon him. We are seeking his help in prayer. That's an evidence of the grace of God. Are you part of the prayer life of your church? Are you at prayer at home as an individual with your wife, with your family, with the fellowship? That's an evidence of the grace of God. An evidence of the grace of God is that we become like Jesus. The disciples, we're told here, first were called Christians in Antioch. That's all we're told. Well, I can think why that might be. They preached Christ, they believed in Christ, they confessed Christ in baptism, they remembered Christ at the Lord's Supper, they sang hymns to Christ. They obeyed Christ. He was at the heart of all that they were and all that they did. And Paul was able to say later, what was probably the, the thinking of these people for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. There are some evidences of the grace of God. How does it happen? Well, I've just told you. It's all down to what God does. It's the evidence of what God has done. In fact, it's emphasized here in verse 21. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. That's how it happened. As these people proclaimed the gospel, God was at work. The Lord's hand was with them. The power of his spirit was with them. Only God and the, the power of his spirit can produce a church like this, can produce any church. We can't produce a church like that, but God's spirit can. The Lord's hand in power, that's the explanation for how this church came into being. Do we have such an expectation tonight of God's continued working by his Spirit on our behalf? That is our hope. And as we think about ways in which we're going to evangelize at Welshpool when we, when we get our building, wherever it's going to be, that we'll have opportunities to think about how it is that we're going to evangelize. But we shall need God to help us to come and work for us as he has done already. When Barnabas arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was, he was glad. You know, my friends, Rachel and I have been glad to see the evidence of the grace of God in Welshpool and here in Newtown. We've been glad. And then Barnabas said to them, he, he was glad, but he encouraged them to remain true to the Lord 
with all their heart. If you've experienced the grace of God, then you're seeking by his grace to live out your Christian life. Go on. Persevere. Wholeheartedly. Following the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Roger, for that really helpful message. And obviously the focus was on the local church and what God can do through the local church. And the head of the church is Jesus Christ himself. So let him be our focus now of our next hymn uh, before we end the live streaming, which is Lord of the Church. Please be seated. If you are watching on the live stream, thank you for joining us uh, tonight. If you're not plugged into a local church, we've seen tonight the importance of the local church. So we'd love to get you plugged into a good Bible believing where these evidences of grace are um, in the local church. We'd love to help you find one. So um, thanks for joining us. And let me just close this time for you by praying now. Lord, we do thank you for what we've heard tonight. We thank you for the, the the, so the words in that song, 
Uh, Lord, we pray that you would bring us nearer to what a church should be, a church that glorifies you, a church that has a huge burden uh, for the lost, a church that has fellowship with one another, a church that builds one another up, and a church that where Christ and him crucified is the focus week by week. Um, Lord, we pray um, that this message tonight would thrill our hearts and would make us value and treasure the local church. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.